so hello again. Um, so I'm making part two for this video on atrial fibrillation because I realised when I got to the end of the first part that I'd actually forgotten to tell you um, what actually causes someone to develop atrial fibrillation. So I thought I'd make a brief second part just to go over the basic causes of this abnormality. So we saw in the previous video about how atrial fibrillation is an abnormality of the atria, usually the left atrium, that leads to there being this tendency towards chaotic atrial electrical activity that leads to the atria fibrillating rather than actually contracting. And we talked about how there's a whole spectrum, um, on one side it being paroxysmal, where it's very rare, i.e. the tendency is quite low, so you only very occasionally go into fibrillation, and on the other side there being persistent, which is quite bad, where um, the tendency is so high that you're pretty much always in fibrillation. And we then talked about these causes up here, but these are not the fundamental causes of atrial fibrillation. These are not the things that actually lead to the abnormality in the left atrium. These are the things that trigger off that abnormal part of the atrium um, and actually lead to them going into the fibrillation, the chaotic electrical activity. So these are not the things that actually cause the abnormality in the first place. They're the triggers for atrial fibrillation rather than the actual causes of the atrial abnormality in the first place. So that's the reason I wanted to make the second part, just to clarify this. So what is the actual thing that leads to someone developing the abnormal um, atrial myocardium, which we've said is usually around the pulmonary veins, that can then be triggered off to cause atrial fibrillation. So the two main ones are ischemic heart disease and hypertension, high blood pressure. So ischemic heart disease, it's disease of the coronary blood vessels. They become narrowed because of atherosclerosis occurring within their walls. And this leads to chronically low blood supply to the myocardium, potentially all over the heart. In addition, the atherosclerotic plaques can rupture and then thrombosis can occur on top of the ruptured atherosclerotic plaque and this can lead to a complete occlusion of the blood vessel that then leads to infarction of the tissue that that blood vessel supplies and that's obviously an MI, a myocardial infarction or a heart attack. So, the abnormal atrial myocardium that is going to cause atrial fibrillation, this can result from either just ischemic heart disease in itself, i.e. chronically low blood supply to this area of myocardium. This is what can, over a long period of time, lead to this abnormality developing. Alternatively, it might be the case that an acute thrombotic event occurred, i.e. an acute MI occurred that affected these portions of myocardium, and that might be the thing that led to the abnormality developing. So lots of the heart cells might have died in that MI, and then after that, scar tissue was set up, and that scar tissue might then be the cause of the abnormal properties of that myocardium that leads to it having this tendency to create um, chaotic electrical activity. So ischemic heart disease, both with and without MI, can lead to the development of abnormal atrial uh, tissue and therefore atrial fibrillation. The other big one is high blood pressure. And we're talking now about systemic high blood pressure. So when we just say hypertension, we mean hypertension of the systemic arterial system, so the aorta, uh, as opposed to pulmonary hypertension, which is hypertension of the pulmonary arterial system. Um, so systemic hypertension, this so if we just draw in the aorta, let's add this into the picture here, and we should probably do it in red. Um, so if we put in the aorta, it comes off here, like so. If you have very high pressure in here, then that's going to be pushing back on the left ventricle. And this means that to eject blood into the aorta, the left ventricle is going to have to push really, really, really hard. So the left ventricle is going to be strained by high blood pressure in the aorta. And that high pressure in the aorta is then going to cause high pressure in the left ventricle. And equivalently, high pressure in the left ventricle is then going to push back on the left atrium up here. So 
both the left atrium and the left ventricle are going to become strained. The left ventricle is going to be strained, pushing blood into the aorta, and then because the left ventricle is struggling, it's not going to be ejecting as much blood into the aorta, and therefore the left atrium is then going to be struggle to push blood into the left ventricle because the left ventricle hasn't ejected as much blood maybe as it would have done. So both of them are going to be strained by systemic hypertension and hopefully you know that long-term high blood pressure um, can lead to remodeling of the left ventricle. It leads to what's called pathological hypertrophy. All of the heart cells get bigger, the wall of the heart of the left ventricle gets bigger. However, this seems like a brilliant idea because it seems as though it's going to make the left ventricle stronger and able to push against the high pressure in the aorta. However, unfortunately, it's pathological hypertrophy. It's kind of something that evolution didn't quite finish. So I'll just write this here, pathological hypertrophy. So even though it seems like a brilliant idea, the left ventricle getting thicker, all the cardiomyocytes getting bigger, it doesn't actually work that well. When the cardiomyocytes get bigger, something goes wrong inside them. And I actually remember um, studying this at one point in great detail, what actually goes wrong in cardiomyocytes that undergo pathological hypertrophy. It's still an area of research. People are very, very interested uh, in what actually happens. But what is known is that when the cardiomyocytes all get bigger, something within them breaks. The apparatus that... Um, makes them contract, part of it breaks, and it's believed to be some issue with the signalling apparatus in there that breaks, and they no longer contract actually as force forcibly. So actually the bigger heart cells become weaker than the smaller ones, so they should never have bothered doing it in the first place. However, unfortunately it seems to be something where evolution had a go, but then <laughs> didn't quite perfect it. Um, so what happens then? Long-term high blood pressure leads to this pathological remodeling of the left ventricle, pathological hypertrophy. The left ventricle gets weaker and weaker over time, and that actually leads to heart failure in the end. Left ventricular failure, hypertensive heart disease, and all of that. However, we're not actually so interested in that. We're interested in what happens to the um, atrium up here, because we're interested in atrial fibrillation. A similar thing happens in the atrium. When the atrial pressure goes up, because the left ventricle pressure has gone up, again, the same thing happens to the atrium. Pathological remodeling occurs. There's straining on all the cardiomyocytes in the left atrium. And actually, usually this leads to left atrial dilatation. And that remodeling, that structural change that occurs, that can then lead to the development of atrial fibrillation. We said right at the beginning of part one of the video that when you image hearts with atrial fibrillation, either through echo or maybe even through cardiac MRI, sometimes you can blatantly see that there's a problem with the atrium. Uh, you can see massive left atrial dilatation and sometimes you can't. In the examples where you can see left atrial dilatation, it is usually because they have hypertensive heart disease. They've had long-standing high blood pressure that has lead to remodeling of the left ventricle and the left atrium. And whilst the left ventricle remodels by hypertrophying, um, by the wall becoming much, much thicker, the left atrium remodels by dilating, and that dilation uh, leads to abnormalities of the conduction system in the left atrium that then leads to it having this tendency towards atrial fibrillation. So those are the two big causes then of developing atrial abnormalities that then lead to you having this tendency towards this arrhythmia. They are ischemic heart disease and hypertensive heart disease. And then remember these things up here are triggers. However, we should just mention alcohol. Alcohol is both a trigger and also a cause. So another cause of you actually developing atrial fibrillation in the first place is chronic alcoholism. Alcohol is cardiotoxic. It can lead to remodeling of the heart. It can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy. So it can damage the ventricles. It can damage the atria. And when it damages the atria, it can lead to atrial fibrillation. Damaging the ventricles can lead to heart failure. So alcohol is both a trigger for atrial fibrillation and also a cause for atrial fibrillation. Um, so maybe we could just end with a summary then. Atrial fibrillation 
it is this condition of the atria that leads to them having a high tendency towards going into this arrhythmia where they have chaotic electrical activity and fibrillate. It is a spectrum with paroxysmal on one end and persistent on the other end. And the two biggest causes of it are long-standing high blood pressure and ischemic heart disease, which is why we get so fussed about putting people on drugs to lower their blood pressure and putting people on drugs to lower their cholesterol to try and prevent high blood pressure and ischemic heart disease. Thank you for watching.